Okay, Selk here. This is what I want to spend a little time on, so uh, because I, I think there's a lot of things about uh, these types of ingredients that are really important, and plus I spent more time playing with this one in the lab to do some things, so I want to talk about it more anyway. <laughs> uh, it has a lot of components in it, a lot of antioxidant components so that you know virtually all the antioxidant components in cell care are fat soluble. So, I mean, if we go down, you know, in, you go down the list that, that's in them, I mean, you know, there's lutein, lycopene, tocotrienols, uh, um, you know, all those things are, you know, beta keratin, EEA, they're all fat soluble, including the fatty acids that are there from flax seed and cranberry seed, et cetera. So, this was a major challenge to really significantly improve the concentration of these in a micelle form to make sure we could get higher amounts in with less amount of work to make them far more efficient to absorb. Also, during the process of playing with this, and I guess if I, my research directors would never have allowed me to say playing when I was in a lab, <laughs> although most of the time in a chemistry lab it really is playing, but you know, want to hear about that, because we discover lots of things by accident <laughs> that we didn't plan to learn. And sometimes you walk away to have lunch and the hot plate just cooks something and you make Teflon, you know? That, 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 that happens. <laughs> that happens sometime, and then you say, oh, I've had this whole plan for months. <laughs> I uh, knew the temperature, uh, you know, and all that. You know, it's sort of, I, I have to tell you, uh, I probably shouldn't reveal this stuff, but... <laughs> When I first micellized beta keratin, beta keratin is a very tough one to micellize. And uh, I was always having trouble doing this. Um, and, uh, you know, because beta keratin is like, it, it's a crystalline material, but they put it into a red paint. It looks like, I mean, thick, thick red paint. And that's what it looks like when you get beta keratin. I mean, some of they make into crystals by you know, diluting it out and stuff. And, uh, I never. I always had trouble doing it, and um, but by accident one day I was working with some other material, some other oils, and I happened to put it on a, another hot plate where I had something else, and I turned my back, and and after a while, sure enough, it I got it into a, a state where it was clear, where I could now make myself out of it, and I was trying to figure out how the heck that happened. <laughs> So I, I at least was smart enough to say, well, I have a lot of stuff to measure some things here. Why don't I check the temperature, the viscosity? Why don't I? So I, I, I did all these parameters and then marked it down as if I had totally planned this exactly the way to do it. <laughs> then I could go up and down on temperatures and I could look at all the things and it finally found out there was a way to really do it. In fact, it's resulted in... Uh, uh, two new patent filings <laughs> so to, to prove that we were geniuses in developing it, of course. That's the why you do and you And you read the write-up and say, damn, I was smart to do it that way. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. It was always sort of a joke among us organic chemists that made stuff that we'd always uh, go to seminars and somebody present this huge complex thing to make this big molecule like... This guy did this one from um, the frog toxins, which are now used to, to block certain muscle spasms. And it's a big complex molecule, and he was going down all the ways, you know, like 15, 20, 30 steps. And it was all presented like you knew the whole time how to get from A to Z right through the maze, you know, like. And after you talked to him, he says, we didn't have any idea how four or five of these steps work. We just had a bunch of graduate students playing around. We found the right way. We, and, but you write up the papers if I knew this is exactly. <laughs> so uh, I knew exactly how to micellize beta keratin. <laughs> it, did, it did happen that way. So at any rate, um, the, one of the major components, of course, in cell care is enzy uh, coenzyme Q10. CoQ10 Co is pretty important in, in terms of, uh, as a lot of people now know, cardiovascular health. It improves cardiovascular tissue. It's a pretty powerful antioxidant, uh, but I want to tell you there, about a, there are several studies. Um, there's an Italian study with uh, 2,600 uh, patients that had uh, you know, uh, coronary um, uh, heart problems. Uh, they had congestive heart failure. And only taking 100 milligrams a day, 
For three months, there was like a 78% improvement in edema, 75% in palpitation, 63% arrhythmias, and they did a whole series of these things. And even in a relatively small therapeutic level, they found these significant effects with just CoQ10. And uh, another study done similar results in Texas, and also they found that heart muscle strength has been improved significantly. And the cardiologists are finally uh, recognizing that, this, that uh, yes, it's a protective nutrient because of its powerful antioxidant effects, but it's very specific protective against cardiovascular disease and problems. And I know a lot of people who have had heart attacks, for example, where you have coronary insufficiency and all of a sudden the heart muscle, muscle goes to pot and they give you EKG and they're, they're measuring what they call ejection fraction. Anybody know that term? Well, that's how much heart, uh, uh, I mean, how much the heart pumps out each time. And you should have about 55% to be normal, but after you've had a heart attack, you know, it might be down to 10, 20%. And depending on the damage, the cardiologist pretty much tells your family to make sure that will's in place because audio's for you. Because muscle, heart tissue won't really come back. Well, it's turning out that's not true now. That actually it can, and there's been a lot of data to show CoQ10 significantly improves the heart muscle so that you actually can get that ejection fraction right back to, to normal. So, and, uh, so there's a lot of interesting things about CoQ10. Also, um, We've added something called citrulline, L-citrulline. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, amino acid, actually, but it, it does something very unique. It detoxifies ammonia. Ammonia is one of the waste products, the way we build up our pneumonia, uh, ammonia, we get rid of it through urea. And this actually reduces the, uh, detoxifies that, and actually increases nitrogen, um, nitric oxide, which is important for heart muscle function. So citrulline is involved in protecting heart muscle and actually improves heart function. And that's why we've, uh, we've included it. Uh, there's a couple other uh, things, of course, we've used the flaxseed oil is present and also uh, cranberry seed oil. Now those two oils are there for the fatty acid content. Uh, both of them are, contain uh, not only omega-6s, uh, which everybody knows about, linoleic acid, but also contain omega-3s. They contain alpha-linolenic acid. Uh, most vegetable uh, sources of oils don't contain omega-3s. Um, Omega-3s principally in animal source foods like fish, etc., where you get EPA, DHA. Now the form of omega-3 in these is alpha-linolenic that gets converted in the body to EPA, DHA. So it's an important to have these fatty acids there as a cellular protection type of effect. And uh, the omega-3 is principally involved in the body protecting against inflammation. They make things called prostaglandins and prostaglandin blockers. If you block certain prostaglandins with these fatty acids, you actually protect against inflammation. And uh, so, so that's why the, these fatty acids are, are, are there. Uh, I, we've known about flaxseed oil being a very handy solvent, if you don't mind the word, not like something where you clean your carburetor with, but cars don't have carburetors anymore. So, well, that's what happens when you're 92. You remember carburetors in cars. They don't have many. But uh, this is actually solubilizing, meaning it helps take the other fat-soluble nutrients, say like the lycopenes, the beta-carotins, and all, all and actually put them into this oil form that we now can make a micelle out of much easier. And what we found out was even more effective was cranberry seed oil. It's really incredibly effective at solubilizing fat-soluble substances that then allow us to make it water-soluble. So cranberry seed oil has a double effect. Not only does it have the fatty acids, but it's a tremendously solubilizing. And that's part of the new things we discovered, at least I did, uh, I knew about it in advance, though. I had it all worked out. <laughs> Somebody said, hey, have you ever done anything with cranberry seed oil? And I thought about it. I know all about it. <laughs> I said, I don't know. It looks like oil to me. Let me try something. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it does have an effect. Also, these particular fatty acids have an effect on reducing lipids in the bloodstream, which is also important for cell protection. You know, the reason we talk about cell protection is because that's the way the body protects itself against everything. The membranes of cells protect against toxins, protects against oxidation, damage, transport. If you don't have proper protection of cell membranes, you're going to have all kinds of problems. 
even in repair, injury, illnesses, et cetera, all related to integrity of the cell. That's why we call it cell protection. So we can reduce fatty acids. You, you know, it helps burn fat. Um, it helps in uh, you know, inflammation protection. That's why those, those fatty acid sources are, are present. Um, also, we have something in there called tocotrienols. Uh, you may have sort of said, well, that sounds sort of like maybe vitamin E, and it is. It's similar to vitamin E. But the tocotrienols, there, there are some really interesting studies on uh, uh, protection against uh, increases in cholesterol. Uh, there's also, uh, they protect against oxidative stress due to damage of the cells more effectively than vitamin E by itself. So they're more complex molecules similar to vitamin E, but they're more effective in some ways in the antioxidant properties. So that's why we have the tocotrienols in there. Also, they are oils. They're harder to mycelize, but not when we use cranberry seed oil. We can use it to, to help that we found out. We also have alpha-lipoic acid. Now, alpha-lipoic acid is an interesting antioxidant. It does protect typically what antioxidants do, but it's very different in that it works in both the water and fat portions of a cell. So it's a little unusual in that it somehow can protect against the water-soluble sides like vitamin C does and the oil-soluble sides like vitamin E. So it has both those properties. So that's what, an interesting antioxidant. Another thing we've just added, of course, is resveratrol. Now, some of you may have heard of that. If you're a wine drinker, you know about resveratrol. It comes from uh, the uh, skins of red, red uh, grapes. And it's a very, very powerful antioxidant. Uh, there's a lot of interesting studies now in resveratrol. I, I wrote down a few of them recently uh, in what, what it really does. There's even some anti-cancer studies going on, but it has a significant effect against a lot of tissue damage, uh, a lot of uh, uh, immune response reactions. Uh, there's a lot, as I said, studies on anti-cancer effects of resveratrol. And, uh, <coughs> It's a very important thing, but again, one of the things with resveratrol, it's not particularly water-soluble. And uh, so the unique thing we did is we made it water-soluble by mycelizing it. And I looked up <clears throat> some study that was just done on looking at the differences between resveratrol taken as in a tablet form versus in a, uh, a water-soluble or mycelized form. Um, the, the study showed that if you took uh, one milligram as, of resveratrol and you were able to solubilize it, it raised the, the, the level in the plasma to 37 nanograms per ml. You don't need to remember that. It, it, they had a level that it increased it to. With one milligram, they found to, in order to get an equivalent level of that plasma level, they had to make a tablet that had 250 milligrams of resveratrol. When you're looking at that, you're looking at something 250 times different. So some molecules, again, when people say, well, how much do I take? I say, what form is it in? Anybody ask me how much do I take, I, I have to know what form you're taking it. If you were taking resveratrol, I say, well, I take five milligrams of resveratrol. I'd say, well, that's great if it's in a form that's soluble, or even three milligrams, or even one milligram because that's equivalent to 250 milligrams in a capsule. So if somebody says, oh, my product has 200 milligrams, I said, terrific, <laughs> have a good time. You're feeding you know, the other end. But um, <laughs> the key is it doesn't get into the bloodstream. And again, this is one of those examples of mycelizing. Now, the unique thing about cell care is that we've taken uh, flaxseed oil, cranberry seed oil, lutein, lycopene, resveratrol, alpha-lipoic, all fat-soluble, uh, citrulline, also fat-soluble, beta-carotene, fat-soluble, E, fat-soluble, all these things, and we put them in one combined uh, uh, process procedure and made them all soluble at one time. And it's sort of been different than the way I've done other things. This, this is completely in one big, huge oil solution that we now make completely water-soluble. And what I want to show you is I'm going to try to leave you with a demonstration of that so that you can remember what this really looks like. So uh, these are not really flasks because it was easier to bring these than trying to bring flasks because otherwise I thought for sure I'd blow up a plane. <laughs> and, and you have to be empty, right? So th these are just two water bottles. So I, I got the water bottles. So what I want to show you, and I'm going to try to put up something that's white in the background. Maybe if we just use the plain screen, I can hold them up. Uh, um, and I can take the mics off of this right here real quick. 
That's all right. What I, what I want to show you is, see, we take cell care. Cell care, all right, we can, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, perfect. This is my, Havana. this is, yeah. <laughs> what does that make me? I don't think I look like Pat Sajak. He, he parts his hair in the middle and I don't even have enough. So this is my new chemistry lab. You know, I actually look good at a lab coat. I really do. I look and if I'm out in production line and I'm wearing my hat and my little booties, I look really so cool. And most of the people see me come and say, oh, God, Dave's coming again. Quick, get out of the way. Because he's going to be sloshing around. And he want to be going doing this. Because I work differently in the lab than most people. I always did, even years back when I was at university. Um, because I guess I wanted to move faster and quicker. I don't sit around and like play with something for like three hours. I'll sit up like eight, ten things at once because I want everything working. And so I used to have my own special glassware made that were little tiny things. In fact, I learned how to do glass blowing from the technical glass blower so I could make my own equipment because I made high vacuum lines and everything because nobody had what I want. I didn't want to take two weeks to do this. I wanted to do ten things at once so I'd so when they see me coming, they say, oh, no, he's going to wipe off our whole lab bench the rest of the day, and he's going to kick us all out. He's going to use all the balances, and he's going to use everything. So uh, I'm only using a tray and two bottles today. So what, what, but what I want to show you is I brought uh, some material, and I'm going to hold it up and do a little demonstration. What, what we did, I told you we put all the fat solubles together, in one big oil, including all the things I mentioned that are in here. And that's the way we do it first. So what you end up with is this material, which looks maybe a lot like, well, soap here. I don't know. Now let me hold up a napkin that's white. Hang on. That might, well, maybe here. You can see that. That's, yeah, that's right. All right. So uh, this is what it looks like as an oil. And say, well, why don't we just take that? Well, what I'm going to just say, okay, this is just water, and I'm going to show you what this looks like, of course, if we pour it all in here. Now, I can, uh, I can shake this up and down. I can do everything I want, stir it, shake it, but guess what's going to happen? You know, all right, so that's, that's cell care pre-mycelized. And you say, well, so what does that mean? Well, that means uh, everything is in an oil, and it's going to float on top. It's all going to come back up. So it's in a big blob, which means it's not going to be particularly well absorbed, because in order to get something absorbed, you want it in the water, right? Because we talked about that. There are mechanisms to absorb fats, but basically it's making a micelle and putting it in. Well, obviously, if you were taking, I don't care if you take it in a capsule form or a tablet form, when you get into the stomach, that's what's going to happen. It's just going to be an oil, and it's going to be there. And yes, the body can break it down, make a micelle out of it, you know, et cetera, and you'll probably get some of that absorbed. But if you did the process correctly, and you actually made that part, or this one, into, uh, and this is cell care, if you actually did that, and you micellized it, and you did the same thing, but you turned it into a micelle, That's what happens. So there's the difference right there. If you take a look at the two, and it's diluted out so it looks orange, but it's the exact same material for both. So there's cell care as oil, cell care as mycelized solution, and that's the difference because even if you're not going to get into the technical explanations, I don't think there's anybody here that would say, if you were taking these, what do you think would be better to absorb? It's pretty clear just on the basis of the, uh, the observation. So I just wanted to, to show you that that's what it is, so at least you'll be able to, in your own mind, say, I think I got a good handle of what mycelization's all about, what absorption's all about, what utilization's all about, and why certain nutrients and certain levels, like in biomedics products, are going to be far better absorbed and utilized than you're going to get in tablets, powders, capsules of other forms. So I was just hoping today to give you a little background on the concept of mycelization, concept on product formulation, a little bit of information about the products, why some of the things are done the way they are, and then just leave you with this thought, that's non-mycelized, that's mycelized, which one do you want? So I'll say with that, thank you very much for your time.